the participation which I was destined to take after my resignation as Chief of Staff of von Rundstedt's Army Group in the offensive on the Western Front is so insignificant that I could not dwell on it in these reminiscences. If I nevertheless do so, it is first of all to pay a debt of gratitude to the brave troops subordinate to me and their outstanding exploits. Next, because the fighting of the 38th Corps after the successful breakthrough through the French positions on the Somme may serve as an example of the organization of the pursuit conducted from the Somme across the Seine to the lawyer, during which our troops kept the enemy at bay until he was finally defeated. In those months, while others continued to work on the scheme for which I was struggling, at first I was assigned the modest task of waiting until the headquarters of my 38 Corps and its constituent signal battalion were established at Stettin. From time to time I received assignments to check on the ground, the progress of the formation of new divisions in Pomerania and Poznan. On May 10, 1940 in Lignitz, where I came for a couple of days on leave, I heard on the radio about the beginning of the German offensive. Naturally, all my thoughts and fervent wishes were in the following days with our troops, striking through the Ardennes. Would we be able to advance rapidly through Luxembourg and break through the Belgian fortifications on either side of Baston before a large French force could get here? Will it be possible to continue the non-stop tank offensive and force the Meuse at Sedan, thus ensuring the encirclement of the enemy's northern flank? But at the same time, as it is not difficult to understand, my head was furrowed with not quite pleasant thoughts about the institution, at such a moment exiled me far to the rear, while in the West was realized the plan for which I fought so long and persistently. On May 10 in the evening an order arrived, according to which the headquarters of the 38th Corps was transferred forward to Brunswick. On May 13 I went from there to Dusseldorf, where we were placed at the disposal of Army Group. In the following days, I had no other occupation than as a loiterer to inspect taken by storm heavily fortified Belgian positions on the mayors near Maastricht and on the Albert Canal, as well as captured as a result of a surprise attack, equipped with the latest technology Fort Ebony Mail. In addition, I inquired at Army Group Headquarters and at 6th Army Headquarters about the progress of operations. What I heard there indicated that there was no clear idea of the enemy's intentions. Oak, apparently, also did not yet have such information and kept silent about their further operational plans. It was limited only to the lengthening of the dividing line between the Army Groups to the northwest. May 16, the Corp headquarters was reassigned to Army Group A. The next day I introduced myself in Bastogne to my former commander, Colonel General von Ronstadt. He, as well as my successor, General von Zodenstern, and the whole staff of my old headquarters, greeted me cordially, and it was only here that I heard how successful the offensive through the Ardennes and the Muyus had been. Sir Corps was to be part of the 12th Army, which had the task of continuing the offensive westward to the Lower Somme while the new 2nd Army was to be put into the breakthrough with a front to the southwest between the 12th and 16th Armies. Arriving at the headquarters of the 12th Army, I immediately witnessed Hitler's intervention in directing the operations of ground forces. There was an order issued by the OK on Hitler's instructions, according to which Kleist's tank group was to advance only as far as the Oise. The 12th Army was ordered to turn to the southwest and go on the defensive. The 2nd Army was now tasked to operate between the 4th and 12th Armies, advancing further west. The order was motivated by the fact that the Fourier under no circumstances wants to allow that at least a temporary failure of the Germans gave rise to a rise in the spirit of the French people, which by that time had already been severely depressed. He feared such a failure. If the 12th Army, as previously envisioned, would continue to strike further west, to the lower summer, and in doing so would have to repel the counter-attack of the French army from the southern direction west of the Myers, directed to her flank. Here already a political figure or even a propagandist began to interfere in the affairs of the commander. On the one hand, it was clear that the suspension of the offensive tank group von Kleist on the Oise carries the danger of missing a decisive victory over the enemy forces in northern Belgium, which this group just had to go to the rear. On the other hand, the order provided that the 12th Army should move to the defence front to the southwest, and this meant giving up the initiative in the area between the Myers and the Oise. In reality, a major counterattack of the French at that time could not be expected. The enemy, at least in the opinion of the command of Army Group A, needed about a week to pull up the necessary forces for a counteroffensive. 
and that's if he even still thought of such plans, and it is precisely to cover the southern flank through the offensive from our side, and strike in the direction of the lower sum was one of the central points of the proposals for the operation, with which the army group in the winter repeatedly appealed to the Okar. Now it appeared that although Hitler did not have the courage to temporarily take the risk on the right flank of the advancing German forces, he already dared to give instructions in his own name on the course of individual operations of ground forces. If he at that time at all could justify the spectre, albeit temporary, failure of his intervention in the direction of operations, it is probably due to the fact that the OK, contrary to the previous proposals of the army group, did not introduce in time in the breakthrough of the Second Army as soon as the forward units of the advancing German troops forced the Mewus, whether between the 4th and 12th armies to continue the offensive on the lower sum, or between the 12th and 16th armies for an offensive to the southwest between the Mewus and the Oyers. It's the insufficient width of the front to introduce new divisions into the first echelon could not have been the reason for this. After all, in the first place it was necessary to have for both only by necessity opposite directions of the offensive and the fulfilment of the corresponding tasks one common army headquarters. The introduction of new divisions into the battle would then be timely and coordinated with the expansion of the area of operations. Serp's example shows once again that the operational plan apparently is never fully realized, as its author thinks, if its implementation is the domain of others, even when there are no good reasons for deviating from the plan. If this intervention Hitler and did not lead to serious operational consequences, but still set him before the 12th Army task for defense allowed the enemy to create a new fortified line on the river end. In the second phase of the offensive it had to be cracked in heavy fighting. The opportunity to finally break the enemy's front in this decisive area by continuing the strike was needlessly lost, and it was in this, along with the encirclement of troops on the northern flank of the enemy, was one of the main ideas of our proposal for the operation, which provided under any circumstances the transition to the second phase of the offensive. Meanwhile, our corps' headquarters was transferred to Luxembourg, in the picturesque small town of Clerf. Our former role of observers was replaced by the task of directing the transfer of several divisions from among those following the Second Army. Not a very honorable task at a time when it indicated a decisive defeat on the northern flank of the enemy. During these days I received word that my brother-in-law, Egbert von Lusch, commander of a dive bomber squadron, was missing in action near Brussels. Egbert, my wife's younger brother, lived with us for a long time in Dresden and Magdeburg, where he attended school. My wife was especially fond of him, and we treated him like a son. His young wife was at that time living with us in Lignitz. She, her mother and my wife were tormented by obscurity and worry for many weeks, because for a long time nothing was known about what happened to the airplane that Egbert was flying, as well as about the fate of his crew. We could only say with certainty that it had been shot down during an attack by the squadron Egbert commanded. It was not until after the campaign in France that I was able to make more accurate inquiries. After a long search, the wreckage of the plane was found in the vicinity of Brussels. Inquiries from local residents revealed that the plane had been hit, apparently by anti-aircraft artillery fire, while transitioning to dive flight. Two crew members managed to parachute out. One of them was killed by Belgian soldiers while still in the air, the other after landing. My brother-in-law and a fourth crew member were either killed by anti-aircraft fire or crashed with the plane. Egbert von Lusch, a gifted young man, was especially beloved by us. Tall, slender blonde, with beautiful expressive eyes, he had a very attractive appearance. His soul was open to all that was beautiful and good. All this was combined in this man who charmed all who knew him. Possessing a high development, he was an excellent officer who loved his work. In case of his death, he left the following letter to the squadron. I ask me not to mourn. I am an idealist and I die as happily as I lived. There is no life on earth more beautiful to me. It is only a pity that I can no longer serve my father and am lost to my wife. About this I will think in the last minutes of my life. May 25. The corpse was tasked to replace the 14 TK, which General von Kleist, together with a nine panzer and two motorized division left to cover its rear in the lower reaches of the summer, on the site Abbeville, Army. On May 27, the shift was made. By this time there were no stable fronts in the lower reaches of the summer. 
14 TK together with the 2nd Motorized Division, held a bridgehead near the town of Abbeville on the left, southern bank of the Summel. 9 PD had the same task near the town of Amiens. Between these two towns there were only patrols all along the Summel. But also the enemy was not able to allocate enough forces to create a new front behind the lower reaches of the Summel. In front of our bridgehead at Amiens stood, apparently, one French colonial division and British units at Abbeville, one British division. The order was to hold the bridgeheads, 9 TD and 2 motorised division, which was to be replaced at Abbeville, for the time being remained as a mobile reserve north of the summer. But then they were, quite rightly, concentrated to take part in the decisive battles off the Channel coast. General von Wittersheim, commanding 14 TK, told me, in passing on the order, that he did not expect any major enemy operations. An hour after his departure, a report arrived of strong enemy attacks on both bridgeheads. Large enemy tank forces also appeared at both sites. By evening, both attacks were repulsed. At Amiens were hit several heavy French tanks at Abbeville, 30 British light and medium tanks. Here only one soldier bring forth from the calculation of anti-tank gun hit nine enemy tanks. He was the first private soldier awarded, at my suggestion, the Knight's Cross. In my opinion, the enemy attacks either had the purpose of their actions in this area to alleviate the position of the northern flank, which was under threat of encirclement, or it was an attempt to create a new front on the lower reaches of the Somme. For us, the same question arose, which I have previously raised in connection with Hitler's order on the Twelfth Army. Was it necessary, as it was stated in the order, and on the lower sum to fight defensive battles, or should we try to keep the initiative in their hands? Defensive tactics, which apparently was prescribed by 14 TK, would give the enemy, there was no doubt about it, the opportunity to create a new strong defence front on the lower summer. In addition, it was problematic in this case and the retention of bridgeheads in the areas of Abbeville and Amiens, as the enemy would pull up here forces. Both motorised divisions left as a reserve north of the Somme, very little suitable for action on the bridgehead. They could not be introduced here to strengthen the defence of bridgeheads. For counterattack, they could be used only if the enemy squeezed our bridgeheads, defeated the divisions there, and then crossed the Somme. I have repeatedly argued to the commander of the 4th Army, to which we were subordinated, that we must now two motorised divisions suddenly force the Somme between both bridgeheads in order to cover the flanks of the enemy units advancing on the bridgehead and break them. It seemed to me that it was better to lead the corps manoeuvre battle to the south, that is, in front of the Somme frontier, until the battle in northern Belgium was over and it would be possible to advance our northern flank across the lower Somme. So our aim was to hold this section and prevent the enemy from creating a continuous front on the summer. In this case it could not be denied that in such a course of operations the corps, since it would be left alone south of the summer, might find itself in a difficult position, but it was necessary to take this risk to avoid in the interests of further conduct of the operation difficult battles against the enemy entrenched on the summer. Unfortunately, the commander of the 4th Army did not accept these are repeatedly made him suggestions. He did not give us for this operation divisions from the 2nd Echelon, which were intended for forcing the river, and we were forced to conduct a defensive battle on bridgeheads. The enemy, therefore, was able to create a continuous front along the Somme between the bridgeheads. In conventional terms, it is known to defend behind the river or to hold it by means of strong bridgeheads. But there is no indication in any textbook that the battle could be fought mobile and in front of the river frontier. In the following days, the enemy continued his attacks on both bridgeheads. That Amien sometimes created a serious situation. However, visiting the troops, I was convinced that everything was in order here, especially successfully repelled attacks 116 Infantry Regiment. On the contrary, at Abbeville on May 29, there was a serious crisis. The 2nd Motorized Division was replaced here by the 57th PD, which had made strenuous marches and had not yet had combat experience. The attacks soon undertaken by the enemy, supported by British tank units, resulted in breakthroughs in some areas and caused us heavy losses, including, as it later turned out, and prisoners. I myself went to Abbeville and had to bring back a battalion which had abandoned its positions on the basis of a falsely understood order and was already following through the town. In the end, the division succeeded in restoring the position since General von Kluge, in the difficult situation created, left even the question of abandoning bridgeheads to our decision.
He rejected our repeated proposal to force the Somme on either side of Abbeville with the newly arrived 6th and 27th Divisions in order to pincer the advancing units there. It was clear that the High Command intended to avoid all reliance until the battle in northern Belgium was over and a systematic deployment of forces could be made against the enemy front now being created. It was also clear that the enemy would use this time to pull up reserves and create a new front from the terminus of the Maginot line near Carignan to the mouth of the Somme, between the Oise and the Mars. Hitler himself lost the initiative and thus facilitated the enemy to create a front along the River Enne. Our command has now also abandoned the attempt to secure the initiative south of the Somme. If in the first period of the German offensive in the West, I was essentially in the role of observer, at least in the second period I could participate in the offensive as a commander of the compound. All attempts to encourage the high command to allow us to attack across the Somme, until the enemy had not built and organized a solid defense across the river, were in vain. These first days of June were used to prepare a systematic offensive, which was to begin in the morning of June 5, 4th Army. In the area, on both sides of the Abbeville acted two army corps. Between it and the 38th Corps was advanced at Ely 15 TK General Gotha. The bridgehead at Amiens with the 9th Division standing there was occupied by the 14th TK, which at the same time passed into the subordination of the army operating on the left. Thus, for the 38th Corps remained an offensive strip of about 20 km on both sides of Piquigny. In this strip in the first echelon of the first attack was to take 46 Sudeten Infantry Division on the right, 27 Swabian Division, 6 Westphalian Division remained at first in the second echelon, in order to enter the breakthrough after forcing the river by the divisions of the first echelon. The terrain on our north bank was slightly hilly. It slowly descended toward the summer, gave no shelter to the troops due to the lack of forests, while the coastal terrain south of the river rose steeply upward and allowed the enemy a good view of the area of our initial positions. The Somme Valley itself, several hundred meters wide, did not allow viewing both forward positions due to the bushes on the river bank. On the south bank in the valley were the villages of Brelli, Eli, Piquini, and Drell, which were apparently particularly strongly held by the enemy. Like most French villages with their massive houses and walls, they were excellent strongholds for the defender, and on the high ground on the south bank, which ran deep into the enemy's defensive line. The villages and large woods also gave the enemy favorable conditions for entrenchment and shelter for his artillery. In the corps strip stood two French divisions, one division of colonial troops and the 13th Alsace Infantry Division. According to intelligence, it was necessary to reckon with the fact that the enemy had as much artillery and perhaps even outnumbered us because of this nature of the terrain and the balance of forces. I believed that success in the offensive could be achieved most quickly by using the moment of surprise. Smed quarters therefore ordered its own artillery not to open fire until after the attack had begun. We also refused to fire preparation of the attack, but only after the start of the attack it was envisaged to open heavy fire on the high southern bank and on the villages located in the valley to exclude any resistance from there when forcing the river. The infantry of both divisions, equipped with inflatable boats, pontoons and assault bridges, was advanced on the night before the attack into the coastal bush on our side of the river. At dawn it was to force the river suddenly, bypassing the villages. The forcing at dawn on June 5 was completely successful on the entire front due to surprise. Only then did the enemy put up resistance on the high bank of the river and in the villages near the river. The enemy fought bravely. The Africans with their characteristic bloodlust and contempt for life, and the Alsatians as stubbornly as can only be expected of this Alemanian tribe, which in World War I had produced many good soldiers who fought on the German side. It was indeed a tragedy to meet these young men as enemies then. When I talked to prisoners, many of them told me not without pride that their father had served in the German army, guards, or the Kaiser's navy. I remembered then many Alsatian recruits who I myself had trained in the Third Guards Regiment and who were for the most part excellent soldiers, such as my former rangefinder Ifluta de Champs. I observed the beginning of the attack at the Corps' command post in a small forest relatively close to the front. As soon as it became clear that the forcing of the river everywhere was successful, I mean, the battle began for the mastery of the dominant high bank of the river and the villages near the river, which had to be taken from the rear. Remarkable was the comparatively weak activity of the enemy's artillery, which did not at all correspond to the number of batteries we had detected. 
Evidently, the French artillery was still very much alive to the experience of positional warfare. Its fire was insufficiently maneuverable, and it could not or was almost unable to, in accordance with the requirements of maneuver warfare to quickly concentrate a strong fire. She did not utilize to the same extent as we did the action of forward observers and had no units to compare with our air divisions. And in this case, the victor had evidently rested on his laurels for too long. At any rate, it was a pleasant surprise to us that the activity of the enemy's artillery was not what it had been under the conditions of positional warfare in World War I. Still, the advance across the Somme Valley was not safe, as the bridge we had built was within range of enemy fire from the village of Brelly. I reached safely, however, 63 PP 27 Division, which, under the command of an excellent commander, Colonel Greiner had just taken possession, though with considerable loss of the high bank. Remarkable was the behavior of the wounded, who, under the protection of the dead space formed by the high bank, were waiting for the transports which had not yet arrived. I then crossed the Summy again, and by another crossing reached the 40th PPD of the same division, which was operating on the left flank of the corps. He lay at this time at the forest near Newley, which was in the offensive line of the neighboring 14 T key, and held still by the enemy, and here, unfortunately, we suffered considerable losses, as the regiment was shelled from the rear from the enemy-held village of Ely. Nevertheless, we also captured the heights dominating over the river valley. The 46th PD acting on the right also successfully crossed the river and captured the high bank. So we could be satisfied with the results of the first day of the offensive, although the fighting for settlements and dragged on until night. From the neighboring corps, we learned that 15 TK also forced the river. However, its further advance was delayed for a long time by the enemy, steadfastly defending the large settlement terrain. As a result, the enemy was able to block the much-needed roads for vehicles. The left neighbor, 14 TK, which was advancing from a bridgehead near Amiens after artillery preparation, was unable to develop an offensive of tanks apparently due to the presence of large enemy minefields here. Further, the corps was turned south, so that our advance then took place without connection with it. The offensive on June 5, in addition to mastering the high bank of the river, also gave such a gain of space south of the summer, that at night the first batteries were moved across the river, but it was still unclear whether the enemy was defeated or whether he would try to organize a stubborn defense in the depths of his position. In such a situation, Reports that could clarify this crucial question are usually absent. The fog of obscurity. The only thing that in war always there is up hid from us the situation and intentions of the enemy. A careless advance could bring a heavy defeat. On the other hand, the loss of a few hours can give the enemy the opportunity to organize a new defense, which then again will have to break through with heavy losses. A military commander who in such a situation will wait until reliable reports do not clarify the situation is unlikely to smile military happiness. He would miss a favorable moment. For this reason, in the early morning of June 6, I was already on the advanced on the south bank of the Summy Command Post 46 Division. Of course, after the tension of yesterday's day, the troops have not yet fully recovered. I pointed out the necessity of starting the pursuit immediately, as the division did not appear to have had direct contact with the enemy. I then rode forward, ordering the regimental units of the 42nd Division which had no orders to move, although the noise of battle could be heard in front of them, and arrived at the right flank regiment of the corps. The regiment was actually ready to advance, but wanted to await the results of artillery fire on the forward-lying village of Kuwazi, adjacent heights and forest edges. There was no intelligence information about the enemy, since I assumed that neither the village, heights nor forest edges were occupied by the enemy, I ordered the commander to immediately move out in a broad front but in dismembered battle orders. If the enemy is really in front of the front, he will discover himself and be suppressed by artillery. When advancing in the order I indicated, there was no need to fear heavy losses. As the commander evidently doubted the correctness of my opinion, I drove forward myself in my passenger car. We reached the entrance to the village of Kuizi and came upon a barricade, which, however, no one was defending. Single shots were heard from the village, evidently of straggling soldiers. After a short reconnaissance we entered the village, which the enemy had abandoned, as well as the adjoining heights and the edge of the forest. With this information I returned to the regiment, which by this time had already moved out, and advised it to reconnoiter itself in future. Naturally the corps commander does not exist to pose as a reconnaissance sentinel. In this situation, however, a vivid personal example was necessary 
especially since the troops did not yet know me, and I was sure that the precondition for a valid pursuit is the initiative of the chiefs. The delight of my adjutant to Belushant von Schwertner and my young driver, Field Phil Nagel, at our accidental reconnaissance raid was a special joy. In the evening I visited the two regiments of the 27th Division which were advancing on the village of Seismont. Somewhat unexpectedly I stopped at the front of one company commander. After informing me of the situation, he thought it appropriate to take advantage in turn of the presence of a high superior. I was obliged, lying on my stomach, to lay out my large map and inform him in detail of the general situation as far as I knew it myself. It was only after I had quenched his thirst for knowledge that I was able to ride back, taking one wounded man who was also eagerly interested in my information about the situation. Fortunately, the return trip was not long, as the corps' command post had been moved during this time closer to the front into the woods. June 7 was introduced into the battle on the right flank of the corps, 6 PD, which a day earlier had moved to the south bank of the summer. The brave Westphalians, who have always been good soldiers, showed a remarkable eagerness to push forward. When I arrived at this division in the morning, I learned that the heavily traversed stretch of Pikes, which might have been good cover for the enemy, had been overcome. The town of Pikes had already been taken, and the regiment was rapidly advancing on the village on the other side of this stretch. It is true that Pikes and the roads leading to this township were under a rather unpleasant exposure to the fire of the enemy's long range artillery. We were somewhat amused by one driver of an ammunition car who, during the shelling of the road, sought shelter under his car loaded with shells. In the evening I was again at one regiment of the 46th Division, which was stationed still in front of the Poix River frontier. But even here it was possible to leave this frontier behind by evening, after the necessary interaction with heavy weapons and artillery had been secured, an interaction which here at first was poorly organized. 27 Division, which had to fight the heaviest battles, was withdrawn to the second echelon as the pursuit developed at a good pace. It was to be replaced on the left flank of the corps just attached to him one cavalry division. June 8 continued the pursuit, and the pace again set the Westphalians. 46 Division reported about 100 enemy tanks, against which flew stormtroopers. However, it was not possible to capture these tanks using the raid of attacking air. They escaped although with more decisive actions they could have been captured. The course of the fighting on June 7 and 8 gave the corps' commanders the opportunity to judge that the defeated enemy is not able to resist, except for a short time and in some areas. It was conceivable that the enemy was endeavouring to save his remaining forces by withdrawing them behind the sign. Beyond the lower reaches of this river, he would probably attempt to organise resistance again, using the reserves still remaining. The corps had, therefore, to make every effort to force the Seine by quick action before the enemy found time and opportunity to organize a defense of the river. Although the corps was still 70 km from the Seine by the evening of 8 June, the corps command ordered the divisions of the 1st Telon not only to reach the scene on 9 June with their motorized advance parties, but also to force it. To need the bulk of the infantry and artillery on horseback were to follow the motorized advance parties on a rapid march in order to reach the Seine the next day as well. The 6th Division was to force the Seine at Andel, the 46th Division at Vernon. Stream endurance was required of the troops, four consecutive days of fighting and pursuit. In war there are times when the Supreme Commander must put the most stringent demands on the troops, if he does not want to miss a favourable opportunity, as a result of which the troops would have to pay dearly for what was missed. In this case, operational considerations also spoke in favour of rapid action. The French, it appears, were still determined to defend Paris. Large enemy forces occupied positions around Paris, running north of the city from the Oise to the Marne. If it had been possible to quickly force the sign below Paris, the fate of these positions would have been sealed, since the troops occupying these positions had nothing to do but to evacuate Paris quickly, if they did not want to expose themselves to the danger of being cut. The situation, therefore, dictated to the corps' commanders to make high demands on the troops. It demanded from commanders of all grades bold initiative and rapid decision-making. It was necessary to take advantage of such a favourable situation. On June 9, from early morning to late afternoon, I was always travelling to ensure that both divisions of the first echelon completed the task. I was pleased to be able to ascertain that our infantrymen, in spite of the preceding strain, were exerting themselves cheerfully to reach the objective the scene. 
despite this, not everything, of course, went smoothly. In the 6th Division, however, everything was going well. Early in the morning I met with both Division Commanders and then visited 46th Division. When I then arrived at the 6th Division crossing point at Andal at noon, I found that the advance parties had already reached the same. The Division Headquarters there had made arrangements for the proposed forcing of the river in the evening. Unfortunately, the bridge was blown up by the enemy before the advance party reached the crossing point, picturesquely situated on a high cliff. The town of Andel was in flames from a storming raid, which we could in no way want in this situation as a notification of our arrival. The 46th Division, however, had some difficulties. First of all, the division began the offensive three hours later than scheduled. When I arrived again at the 46th Division after visiting the 6th Division, it had lost all communication with its advance party, which, at any rate, had not yet reached the Seine as the advance party of the 6th Division had managed to do. When I was on my way again to the 6th Division, I had no choice but to let the commander of the 46th Division know that I wished to meet him in the evening at his crossing at Vernon. I told him that he should arrive there at least with his lost advance party. Churning again to Andal, saw that the crossing of the scene in three places was in full swing with little resistance from the enemy. The infantry and artillery on horseback had done their best to reach the Seine in time this day. When I arrived at Vinoy about seven o'clock in the evening, I actually found there the commander of the 46th Division with his advance detachment. Unfortunately, even here the enemy had time to destroy the bridge, as Vinoy was being shelled by heavy mortar fire from the south bank. I ordered the advance party to cross at night under cover of dark. With such a rapid pursuit, I could not utilize the 1st Cavalry Division, which had arrived in the corps, as I wished. It was still far away and was subordinated to me by the army with a clear instruction to introduce it to cover the left flank of the army at Paris on the Oise. However, the division reported to me that it was still far from my forward divisions. It was attacked by a large tank force of the enemy. Clearly, we were talking here about the tanks that had previously escaped from 46th Division and were now operating in our rear flank. When I arrived in Vernoy again after a short night on June 10, the first parts of the 46th Division had already crossed the river. Thus the 38th Ack was the first to reach the south bank of the scene. The troops could be justly proud of the pursuit they had conducted. I was happy that thanks to the quick actions of the corps we avoided, perhaps, heavy fighting for the crossing of the scene. But the position of the corps was still not an easy one. It stood alone on the south bank of the Seine. Acting on his right, 15 corps reached the sign at Rouen only June 10, that is, a day later, and was turned to Le Havre, followed by two Ac was still far from the Seine. On the left flank was completely unclear situation in the area of Paris, the garrison of which was not known. In addition, 38 AC needed two more days to cross the river all their forces. Light pontoon bridges, built at Andel and Vernon, were all the time the object of repeated raids by British aircraft which managed for a while to disable the bridge at Vernon. If the enemy command had any reserves on this flank, if it had taken the initiative, it could have attacked the isolated south of the River 38 AC. The commander of 4 Army, Colonel General von Kluge, informed me at the beginning of the offensive that the Army's operational objective, as received from the Oak, was to seize bridgeheads south of the scene. Although the High Command did not intend to seek a solution to this second phase of the French campaign in the spirit of the Schlieffen Plan, by advancing a strong northern flank for deep coverage west of Paris, as I had once suggested, and was going to realize, as it is now clear, with great success, the strike of massive tank forces east of Paris to the south, the task specified for army was too modest. Even if they were going to seek a solution by striking east of Paris, and therefore, the breakthrough of Army Group C through the Maginot Line, and the offensive of Army Group to the Lower Seine was to be auxiliary actions. It was still necessary to hold the initiative and on the outer flank. Army Group began the offensive across the Aisne only on June 9. It was still difficult to foresee whether its strike would really bring the desired decisive success. In addition, we had to assume that the enemy, having in mind just the Schlieffen plan, was aware of the danger of deep coverage across the lower scene and took their countermeasures. The more important was to hold the initiative and on the right flank, and not to give the enemy time to deploy here for defence or for the offensive. If, therefore, in my opinion, the operational task of the 4th Army required an immediate continuation of the offensive south of the Seine, then the 38th Army, it seemed to me, should not wait on the bridgehead until the enemy concentrated superior forces against him. 
I requested the army's consent to begin the southward advance immediately after the corps artillery had been moved across the river, instead of, as ordered, holding the bridgehead, which the corps had extended in the meantime to the Ewer River. The 27th PD had been advanced in advance to the south bank of the Seine. On June 11 I requested permission to move to the south bank of the Seine also the 1st Cavalry Division, which had fortified itself on the Oys, and had on that day won a fine victory over the tanks mentioned earlier. In this situation it seemed to me quite natural that our only cavalry division should be the first and in pursuit. I had intended to put it ahead of the corps, with the task of quickly cutting from the southeast railroads and highways leading to Paris. Unfortunately, my proposals were rejected. I was informed that the army is waiting for instructions on further offensive. The one cavalry division was then taken from me, and reassigned to the one AC, which was in the second decalon, so that it could under all circumstances still cover north of the Seine flank on the Oise. Thus, to my regret, this fine division was not given the task that was so suited to it. On the evening of June 11, two events occurred which, in my opinion, confirmed the correctness of our considerations. A pilot was shot down in the location of 58 PP6 Division, in whose possession was found an order containing data on the retreat of the enemy on a wide front. Consequently, it was necessary to follow him on his heels. On the other hand, 46 Division reported that a major tank attack was underway against it, a sign that our stay south of the scene was clearly very unpleasant for the enemy. Further, our waiting could not increase for him this unpleasantness, but only to reduce it. On the morning of June 12, the 46th Division, which had just repulsed an attack with heavy losses, reported that the enemy was concentrating in front of its front, and urgently asked for help. I decided at my own risk to launch an offensive with all three divisions, but as soon as I gave the order, as the army commander appeared, although he approved of my intention, but still believed that in the absence of new operational instructions from the OK better to wait. He was concerned, of course, mainly about the fact that my corps will operate ahead alone. He gave, therefore, a strict order not to continue the offensive behind the line Eve Ruas. Pacia, an order which was once again confirmed for certainty in the evening order for the army, the advance of the 27th Division, which was operating on the left, was going well while the 46th Division reported that it could not advance. It did not have sufficient artillery, ammunition, and food on the south bank. She, however, had to repel tank attacks, but there were only 50-60 of them. In the following days the battle again took the character of pursuit. June 13, 2 AC on our right also forced the Seine. On this day our headquarters was located in a small chateau, which belonged to the famous writer Colette Darville. Unfortunately, she was absent. I spent the night in her bedroom, which served as a salon at the same time, was very elegantly furnished and, according to old traditions, had its own door to the park. We enjoyed the use of the swimming pool in the park. On June 14, the commander of the ground forces visited us. I informed him of the successes of the corps, which he took note of, but said nothing about further objectives. June 15, Colonel General von Klage informed me that the army must now seize the city of Le Mans. It is necessary to pursue the enemy rapidly without waiting for neighbors. This is not new wisdom for us. On June 16, the divisions of the corps again ran into organized resistance on the line of Ferte Vidam Sinontius Chaton Uve. These were units of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd mechanized divisions, which had been operating in Flanders, had been evacuated from Dunkirk, and had unloaded again at Brest. In addition, units of two colonial brigades and one Moroccan division reappeared. In the evening, the enemy's resistance was broken. Tier 2. A fine impression was left by the units of the 6th Division, which I visited while touring all the divisions. In the evening, we received an order from the army where we were given the direction. Lee Mans, Angers on the Lee Rear. One AC is to advance on our left and 46th Division is to be transferred to it. 15 TK, with the exception of one division, which was to seize Cherbourg, was given the direction to the lower lure in order to form bridgeheads there. So this, it turned out, was the operational plan. June 17. It became known about the resignation of Reinhard and the appointment of the old Marshal Patain. Was he to organize resistance, or did the politicians want to give the old honored soldier of the First World War the right to sign the surrender? The Führer's order received on June 18 demanded the most vigorous pursuit, which was no news to us either. Further, it demanded the rapid occupation of the old imperial regions of Toul. Verdun, Nancy, the Creso factories and the ports of Brest and Cherbourg.
we made a forced march in which one regiment covered 78 kilometers. The motorized advance party under Colonel Lindemann reached the area west of Lee Mans. I spent the night in the castle of Bonitabul of medieval splendor. In front, behind a rampart with a lift bridge array with four large towers with walls three meters thick. At the back there was a courtyard with two towers in the corners of the courtyard, along with the castles on the Lure, which I was soon to see. It was the most magnificent structure I had seen in France. The interior decoration was also magnificent, and the chateau still contained some of the servants. The owner of the chateau, Mr. Rochefort, Duke of Doudnay, had unfortunately fled. On the morning of June 19 to get to Lindemann's advance party, I travelled 50 cam without seeing a single German soldier. I arrived at Le Mans where my grandfather had entered as a victor 70 years earlier and toured the magnificent cathedral there. On the way I met detachments of French soldiers moving eastward without arms and a whole artillery division with all its guns and machines surrendered to Lindemann. The enemy army was clearly beginning to disintegrate. Despite this, Lindemann's detachment held up in front of a section of the Mayenne River near Lyonangers. On the opposite bank they found enemy machine guns firing on the bridge and tanks. Lindemann tried in vain to suppress them with a single battery of 100 M guns at his disposal. I headed away from the bridge to the front near the river and found that there was apparently no enemy at all, or a very small force, here. I recommended to one company commander, who was apparently waiting on the bank, to see if the enemy would leave the bridge, to force the river downstream. If he wanted to, I would accompany him. This suggestion worked. After a while, the soldiers of the company undressed, jumped into the river, swam across it and reached the shore without any losses. The bridge, on the approaches to which, unfortunately, were already lying dead, was captured. I remained still in the advance party until it began to advance on the opposite bank, and then returned to my command post. Still, the enemy with a few tanks and machine guns held the detachment on Mayenka for eight hours. Immediately upon arrival at the command post, I sent my first adjutant Oberlutnant Graf again to Lindemann with strict orders to the forward detachment still at night to cross the Lure. Indeed, he found this detachment preparing to cross to rest on that bank. The adjutant succeeded, however, that the detachment crossed the river at night, and he himself got into the first inflatable boat. During the night reports arrived at the Corps CP from both divisions that the forward detachments had crossed the Lure. I immediately rode forward and was struck by the grandeur of the river which at the western crossing at Ingrad was about 600 metres wide and had a strong current. Set the high bridge two spans had been blown up. In this gap it was necessary to build a pontoon bridge and due to the difference in height of nine metres it was necessary to use steep slides. Later it was terribly difficult to drive a car down these slides. In any case, heavy vehicles had to be transported, which was quite difficult with the width of the river, strong current and the presence of many shoals. The other crossing near Chalon was easier, as the river was divided into three branches. The bridges over both northern branches were in our hands unharmed, therefore it was necessary to make a bridge only over the last branch, which was 160 metres wide. Here I observed a kind of duel. In the morning the French soldiers showed themselves on that bank only unarmed. By evening heavy tanks appeared in front of both bridges. Our units advanced to the other bank, could not hold them back as guns and anti-aircraft artillery could not yet be transferred there. Thus, at the crossing at Chalone, I saw an 88 mm anti-aircraft gun on our side and a heavy tank on the other side, prepared to open fire at the same time, and both opened fire at the same time. Unfortunately, our gun was immediately hit. At the same moment, however, our light anti-tank gun appeared and with a lucky hit on the most vulnerable spot of the enemy 32-ton tank set it on fire. In the evening I stopped at the Chateau de Saran, situated near Chalonne. It was a huge, magnificent building, flanked by powerful towers and horseshoes surrounded the front courtyard. A moat was built around the castle. The castle belonged to the Duke of Tremoville, Prince of Tarentum. This is one of the most prominent names of old France. The dukes inherited the latter title about 1500 years ago, having been twinned with the Anjou family in Naples but they did not succeed there to the throne, which Ferdinand took possession of. A member of the Tremolil family, together with Bayard, were the only persons who held the title of knight without fear or favour. The castle contained, especially in the marvellous library, many historical documents from the days when its owners were Stuart supporters. The whole of the lower floor was, however, inaccessible, as the furniture of the royal palace at Versailles was stacked here, as in other castles.
I myself was placed in one of the rooms in the tower on the upper floor, which was arranged as a salon for the Grand Lever, with a magnificent bed under eight octogenarians, with a magnificent bed under an eight-foot canopy. Next to it was a sumptuous dressing room with a marvellous vaulted ceiling. The castle, which had a white stone facade and four huge grey stone towers, was situated in a huge park. A magnificent grand staircase with a vaulted renaissance ceiling led to the first floor rooms, wonderfully decorated with paintings and tapestries. It is clear that here, as in all other places, we were attentive to other people's property and handled it with care. We managed by June 22 to transfer the 6th and 27th Divisions to the south bank of the Loire. The advance units had advanced even deeper. Many French soldiers surrendered as prisoners. June 23. We received news that the day before an armistice had been signed in the Campine Forest. The campaign in France was over. In my corps order I thanked the division's subordinate to me, which not a single tank defended and not a single vehicle drove, for their sacrifice, heroism and successes. They were able, thanks to a successful offensive, to organize a pursuit to a depth of 500 km, which rightly bears the name of Marshrossing to the lawyer, has the wheel of history turned, but from Compeen 1918 to Compeen 1940 lay a long road. Where will it take us next? The OK is preparing a partial demobilization, the rich stag meeting in Berlin. What now? The absence of a war plan, victory over England by air and sea warfare, fighting for the Mediterranean? An invasion of the British Isles? This was Operation Sea Lion feasible. Reasons for not invading. Late decision, minor successes in the Battle of Britain. Hitler's political position towards Britain. The huge risk of a war on two fronts. The day of victory over France redeemed for Germany. The black day of defeat on November 11, 1918, recorded in Marshal Fox's saloon car at Campeen. France was now to sign its surrender in the same place, in the same wagon. On June 22, 1940, Hitler reached the pinnacle of his glory. France, whose military might had been a threat to Germany since 1918, 18 as France's eastern satellites had been before, ceased to exist as an adversary of the empire. England was driven off the mainland, though not finally defeated. Although in the east the Soviet Union, now a neighbor of the German empire, posed a latent danger despite the Treaty of Moscow. It could hardly be assumed that, in view of the German victories over Poland and France, it was about to launch aggression in the near future. If the Kremlin at that time intended to use the fact that Germany was tied up in the West to expand its expansion, it must have missed the moment for such action. Apparently, too, Moscow did not count on such quick and complete victories of the German army over the Allied armies of the Western powers. If the German army achieved such success in Poland and France, it was not due to the fact that its command was preparing revenge from the first days after Campeen. Say contrary to all the assertions of propaganda hostile to us, it is quite clear. If we take a sensible view of the danger which might threaten the empire in the event of war, that the German general staff between 1918 and 1939 did not aim at launching a war of aggression or revanchized war, but sought to ensure the security of the state. It is true that the military command placed itself ultimately at Hitler's disposal after his stunning political successes. It can also be said that it recognized the primacy of politics, a politics of which it disapproved and which it could, if such a possibility existed at all, prevent only by means of a coup d'etat. The decisive factor in the victories we won, however, was not the extent of Germany's rearmament which Hitler forced by all means. Of course, taking into account the disarmament of Germany, imposed on it by the Versailles dictate, this rearmament was a prerequisite for any successful conduct of the war. In reality, however, the German army could not field in the war as superior a force as the Soviet Union could with respect to land forces and the Western powers could with respect to aviation. In fact, the armies of the Western powers in terms of divisions, tanks and artillery were equal to the German army and in part even superior. It was not the military potential that was decisive for the campaign in the West, but the high training and better leadership of the German troops. The German army had learned something from the end of the First World War, and again remembered the immutable laws of military art. After the armistice, the OK first took measures aimed at demobilizing a large part of the divisions. At the same time, several infantry divisions were to be reorganized into tank or motorized divisions, Headquarters 38, Axie was first transferred to the area of Sansula on the Middle Lower. 
in order to supervise here the reorganization of these several divisions. So we replaced the marvelous Chateau de Saran, filled with historical memories, with a small chateau that the famous factory worker Quantra had built for himself on top of a steep hill overlooking the Loire Valley. Our new house was intended to represent the old fortress, and was characterized by the tastelessness which usually characterizes all imitations. It's the tower next to the dwelling house, imitated from the ruins of an ancient fortress, did not alter the situation in any way. The small cannons on the terrace did not give the impression of trophies of war that the owner, a liquor manufacturer, had hoped for. What was beautiful was the view from the top of the mountain over the wide fertile Lura Valley. Characteristic of the taste of this upstart chateau owner was a large painting hanging in his study. On it were depicted sitting at a round table crowned rulers of Europe. At the beginning of the century, our Kaiser, the old Emperor Franz Joseph, Queen Victoria and others. They were depicted as if Quantra had already drunk them a little <coughs> above them too. The proprietor towered at the table, raising a glass of Quantra's liquor in triumph over the table company. The only change we made in this castle was that we took down the vulgar smear. On July 19, all the top leaders of the army were summoned to Berlin to attend a meeting of the Reichstag, where Hitler proclaimed the end of the Western campaign. At this meeting he expressed the gratitude of the nation by honouring the top military leaders. The extent of these honours spoke to the fact that Hitler considered the war already won. While the German people certainly accepted the honouring of deserving soldiers as quite natural, still, in their form and size, these honours at least as perceived by us, the soldiers of the army, went beyond the bounds of necessity. If Hitler gave to one the rank of Grand Admiral and to twelve others the rank of Field Marshal, it only prejudiced the importance of such a rank, which was accustomed to be regarded in Germany as the highest rank. It had hitherto been customary that the condition for receiving such distinction was independent leadership of a campaign, a battle won or a fortress conquered. After the Polish campaign, in which these conditions were fulfilled by the commander of ground forces and commanders of both groups of armies, Hitler did not find it possible to express his gratitude to the army by producing them in the rank of field marshals. Now he immediately created a dozen field marshals. Among them were, along with the commander of the land forces, who led two brilliant campaigns, the chief of the general staff of the armed forces, who did not command anything and did not hold the position of chief of the general staff. Further, among them was the state secretary for the air fleet, who, whatever his abilities, could not be equated with the commander of the ground forces. Most sharply Hitler's position manifested itself in the fact that he singled out the commander of the Air Force Goering, appointing him Reichsmarschall and awarding him alone the Grand Cross to the Iron Cross, without similarly noting the commanders of the land forces and naval forces. His form of distribution of honours could only be seen as a deliberate belittling of the role of the commander of the land forces, so the facts show. In this too clearly manifested Hitler's attitude to the OK and his assessment of its activities. On the day of the Reichstag meeting, I learned that our corpse was to receive a new task. We were transferred to the Strait Coast in preparation for the invasion of England. Three infantry divisions were assigned to us for this purpose. We were stationed at Touquet, an elegant seaside resort near Boulogne, where many beautiful villas were owned by the English. Our headquarters were housed in a large hotel in the construction of which no expense had been spared, while I, with a small circle of persons, occupied a small villa belonging to a French shipowner. The landlord, though he had fled, had left a family manager, so that there were people here who could keep the house and furniture in order and guard them. Contrary to what I had to see later in Germany, we by no means behaved like gentlemen who dispose at will of other people's property. And on the contrary, we paid strict attention to the maintenance of order in all the houses occupied by our troops. The removal of all furniture or the seizure of valuable objects as souvenirs was not in accordance with the customs of the German army. When I once passed by one villa which had recently been abandoned by our unit and was in quite a mess, I ordered the company commander to return to the villa with a team and restore order there, owing to the impeccable behaviour of our troops. Our relations with the French population during the six months that I spent in France were in no way marred. The French, with all their politeness, showed a restraint worthy to be noted, and this only won our respect. However, each of us was more or less enchanted by this blessed country. See how many monuments of ancient culture, beautiful landscapes and masterpieces of famous cuisine were there, how many goods there were in this rich country. True, our purchasing power was limited, 
only a certain percentage of our allowance was given in occupation money. This rule was strictly adhered to, at least in the land forces. In this way, the understandable thirst for acquisitions was moderated, and this was highly desirable in the interest of preserving the prestige of the German army. This money was enough to make an occasional trip to Paris and to enjoy the charms of that city for a day. During our stay on the coast until November, we enjoyed sea bathing, which was enjoyed by my new adjutant, Oberlutten Specht, my faithful driver, Nagel, and stableman Runge, who also took long walks on horseback along the coast. It should be noted that in the strait, the height of the tide reaches eight meters compared to the low tide level. This circumstance played a great part in the question of the possibilities of landing on the English coast, as well as in the choice of time for entering the ports during the invasion. Once, while bathing, we swam far out to sea, and our Mercedes was suddenly seized by a tidal wave. It was only at the last moment that it was pulled out of the already wet sand by a tractor trailer, but Nagel managed to catch an original trophy in the sea. Far out to sea floated a bridge from a sunken steamship. Nagel climbed on it and soon appeared from the captain's cabin with a net, rackets and table tennis balls, which we added to our arsenal of sporting accessories. In this strange way, perhaps no one has ever before been able to acquire table tennis. The joy and pleasure of this beautiful country and the lull after the campaign had been won did not, however, cause the soldiers to disband, as is usually the case with occupation troops. On the contrary, the commanders were faced with the task of training the units for an entirely new task. The troops were trained daily in a coastal area covered with dunes, and much like the areas where the landing was to take place. After our means of transportation arrived, converted boats from the Elbe and Rhine, small fishing boats and launchers, we were able to conduct in calm weather, along with the naval ships, exercises in landing and disembarking sea landings. In doing so, Many had to take a cold bath if the boat was ineptly brought to shore. The young Fenrix of the Navy also had to first master this new task. One could not take offence at them for doing it without much enthusiasm. Commanding a boat from the LBA was not like serving on a beautiful cruiser or submarine. It was also difficult with the old skippers, owners of boats or steamers, who, together with the Fenrix, stood on the captain's bridge of these somewhat adventurous invasion vessels. But in spite of everything, Everything in this preparation for an unusual task was done with fire, and we were convinced that we could cope with it. It will be appropriate to make here some criticisms of Hitler's plan to land in England, and especially the reasons that led to the abandonment of this intention. If Hitler, after the victory over France, really thought that the war was already won, and it remains only to instill this thought in England, he was clearly mistaken. It's that cold refusal, which was met in England his extremely vague peace proposal, showed that neither the English government nor the English people are not inclined to such a thought. Hitler and his OP were now faced with the question, what now? This question inevitably arises before a statesman or commander when, during a war, strategic blunders or unexpected political events, such as the entry of new states into the war on the side of the enemy, create an entirely new situation. Then nothing else remains but to change the war plan. In such a case, the figures concerned may be blamed for overestimating the forces of their state and underestimating those of the enemy for misjudging the political situation. But if the statesmen and military leaders should ask themselves the question, what now? After military operations according to their calculations, in this case even beyond their calculations, have led to a victory over the enemy. If the defeated enemy has escaped to his islands, one has to ask oneself whether the German side had any war plan at all. Of course, no war goes according to a once-established program, according to a plan that one side has worked out. But if Hitler went to the risk of war with France and England in September 1939, he should have thought in advance how to deal with these states. It is clear that the German high command, before and during the campaign in France, had no war plan as to what should be done after winning the war or how to continue it. Hitler hoped for England's pliability. His military advisers, in turn, believed that we should wait for the Führer's decisions. On this example, it is especially clear what leads to the inexpedient organization of the highest military body developed in our country as a result of the transfer of the general command of the armed forces to Hitler without the simultaneous creation of the imperial general staff responsible for the leadership of all military actions. In fact, along with the head of state who determined policy, there was no military authority responsible for directing military action. 
Hitler had long ago relegated the OPB to the position of a military secretariat. Chief of the Okgiki Kel was not at all in a position to advise Hitler on strategic matters. Commanders of the three branches of the armed forces, Hitler, gave almost no rights to influence the overall direction of military action. They could only occasionally express their opinions on matters of warfare, but Hitler made decisions, in the end only on the basis of his considerations. In any case, he reserved to himself the right of initiative, so that I do not know of a single case in which an important decision in matters of the general conduct of the war came from the command of one of the branches of the armed forces. Since no one had the right to draw up a war plan, least of all, of course, the OCBB, practically everything was reduced to waiting for the Führer's intuition to manifest itself. Some, like Ketel and Goering, is in superstitious veneration of Hitler, others, like Broschitsch and Redder, fallen in spirit. Nothing changed the fact that the headquarters of the three branches of the armed forces had opinions affecting the conduct of the war for the long term. Thus, Gross Admiral Raider in the winter of 1939 FOT gave the task to the general staff of the naval forces to study the technical possibilities and conditions of the operation of landing in England. For there was not a single military authority, not a single individual who, in the spirit of the activities of a true chief of the general staff, would have been recognized by Hitler not only as an expert or executor, but also as a military advisor on questions of the general direction of military operations. In the present case, however, the result of such an organization of the higher military organs was that after the campaign in the west of our continent was over, as has already been said, the question was, what now? Along with this question, the highest German leadership was confronted with two facts. One, the fact of the existence of an undefeated and non-negotiable Great Britain. Two, the fact that Germany, due to the possible sooner or later entry into the war of the Soviet Union, now its immediate neighbor, was under the latent threat of war, which Hitler had mentioned as early as 1939, when he stressed the need to achieve immediate victory in the West. These facts indicated that Germany must end the war with England in the shortest possible time. Only if this succeeded could it be considered that Stalin had finally missed the opportunity to use the strife between the European states to continue his expansionist policy. If no peaceful solution could be found, Germany must try to use military force to quickly deal with its then last enemy. In the tragedy of this short period of time, which determined for a long time the fate of Europe, was the fact that both sides did not seriously seek a peaceful solution of the question on a reasonable basis. It is quite certain that Hitler would have preferred to avoid war with the British Empire, since his main objectives were in the East. But the method he chose at the Riksdag meeting after the end of the campaign in France for so vague a peace proposal to Great Britain could hardly have elicited a favourable response from the other side. Besides, it is doubtful whether Hitler, who by then had already been possessed by a criminal megalomania, would have been ready for a peace based on reason and justice if England herself had made a serious proposal for it. Besides, Hitler was already a prisoner of his former affairs. He had given half of Poland and the Baltic to the Soviet Union, a fact which he could liquidate only at the cost of a new war. He had opened the way to satisfy the aspirations of Italy to seize areas under French domination, and thus found himself dependent on his act. Finally, after Prague, he ceased to be trusted in the world, and he lost all confidence in the powers which might have been willing to conclude treaties with him in accordance with his aspirations. The German people, however, in their masses would have admired Hitler had he after his victory over France, achieved a negotiated peace on a reasonable basis. The people did not want to annex to Germany areas dominated by the Polish population, nor did they approve of the ideas of some fantasists who, citing ancient history, wanted to justify these claims by pointing out that these had once been areas of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. In Germany, with the exception of some fanatics in the party, they never seriously believed in the idea of a people king called to rule in Europe or even the world. The people only needed Hitler to placate his pack of propagandists by paving the way for the attainment of a reasonable peace. On the other hand, the English national character, so fully embodied in the personality of Churchill's head of government, prevented England in that phase of the war from seriously seeking then, and later, a reasonable constructive agreement. One has to wonder at the persistence of the English under all circumstances determined to continue the struggle they had begun, no matter how threatening their situation was sometimes. To this it must be added that this hardening, unyielding hate of Hitler 
and his regime dulled the ability to recognize the even more formidable danger that was created in Europe in the face of the Soviet Union. It is also clear that British policy was captive to traditional considerations of European equilibrium, which involved the overthrow of what had become the Soviet Union, which presupposed the overthrow of an overpowering state on the continent. They turned a blind eye to the fact that in the changed world, it was necessary to restore world equilibrium in view of the fact that the Soviet Union had become a great power, and in view of the danger that this country, devoted to the idea of world revolution, posed. In addition, the head of the British government, Churchill, was too bellicose. He was a man who thought exclusively about war and the desired victory, and looked at the political future through the prism of these military goals. Only a few years later, when the Soviets approached the Balkans at its nerve centre of Britain, Churchill recognised the danger inherent here, but at that time he could do nothing with Roosevelt and Stalin as allies. At first he believed in the strength of his nation, and that the United States would eventually fight the war with its president on the side of England. But how little the bulk of the American people at the time, for all their antipathy to Hitler, were prepared to do so. The latent threat that the Soviet Union posed to Germany could not, of course, escape the gaze of a man like Churchill. As for the war, he saw it as a hope for England. On the contrary, the thought of an agreement with Germany found no place in his brain, for such an agreement would very likely be followed in the near future by a struggle between both totalitarian states. While a judicious weighing of the strengths and weaknesses of the two states did not allow one to expect with certainty a complete victory for either of them, it was hoped that they would both bind themselves to such a war for a long period of time, which would result in their mutual weakening situation would inevitably have the consequence of giving both Anglo-Saxon powers the role of world judges. It is also possible that a war between both totalitarian states will lead to the demise of their regimes. In the times of dictatorships, ideologies, crusades, the masses of people being excited by unrestrained propaganda, the word reason is unfortunately nowhere capitalized, thus to the detriment of both nations and to the misfortune of Europe. It turned out that both sides chose to settle the dispute between England and Germany by force of arms. It's the question what now, which confronted the German high command after the end of the war with France was resolved, therefore, in the spirit of continuing the war against England, but the fact that, for the reasons I have outlined, Germany had no war plan which provided for the continuation of hostilities after the campaign in France was to have dire consequences. After Hitler had accepted the plan to defeat England by invasion, no practical preparations had been made for the task. The result was that we missed the best chance to take immediate advantage of England's weakness. The measures now taken for the offensive took a long time, so that the success of the landing was doubtful already because of the meteorological conditions alone. This last fact, along with others of which I shall speak, gave Hitler an excuse or pretext, refusing to invade to turn his back on England in general, in order to then turn against the Soviet Union, the results are known. Before dwelling on the reasons for this decisive change of front, I shall dwell on the possibilities which would have arisen had Hitler been prepared to wage war with England to the last. Three paths were possible here. The first way, an attempt to bring England to its knees by blockade of its maritime communications. Germany had favourable prerequisites for this, as she now owned the coasts of Norway, Holland, Belgium and France as bases for aircraft and submarines. Less favourable was the situation with the necessary means of combat. The Navy in no way had even approximately enough submarines, not to mention the heavy ships, especially aircraft carriers, with which the submarines could interact. In addition, it turned out that England's fight against submarines will be effective until the English aviation is not defeated. As for the German aviation, it would have the following tasks in this struggle to gain air supremacy, at least to an extent that would preclude the exposure of English aviation to submarine warfare, a paralyzing English ports by destroying them, effective cooperation with submarines in the fight against enemy transports. Practically, this was to have the prerequisite of the destruction of English aviation and the destruction of England's military potential. Of the course of the Battle of England showed that the German aviation in 1940 was not strong enough to accomplish this task. It is not worth deciding now the question of whether the results would have been different if the weather conditions in August and September were not so unfavorable, and if the German leadership in the most apparently critical moment for the enemy would not stop fighting with British aviation, which would not throw planes on London. 
In any case, in the summer of 1940, in view of the limited number of bomber aircraft and the lack of fighters with a long range, it was hardly possible to confidently expect the rapid achievement of the destruction of British aircraft and the destruction of the military potential of England. A war that was to be largely solved by technical means still required far more manpower and time than we had envisioned. In a war between roughly equivalent opponents, a quick outcome is usually achieved only by the best military skill, and less often by fighting armed forces to the exhaustion of one of the opponents, as would inevitably have happened here. It was necessary from the beginning, therefore, to prepare for a long war. In order to ensure success, it was necessary to multiply the military aviation as much as the submarine fleet was once increased. I must make it quite clear that the idea that a country as large as Great Britain can could be quickly brought to its knees by operational air warfare in the spirit of General Dewey was, at any rate at that time, only a dream. The same was later revealed in the Allied air war against Germany. In any case, it was necessary if they decided to defeat England by blockade of maritime communications to turn all the military power of the country to strengthen the submarine fleet and aviation. For this purpose, it was necessary to reduce the land army in order to free up manpower. In the prolongation of this war lurked the main danger. No one could know how long the Soviet Union would wait if we took the path of reducing the land army and tied our air force to the struggle against England, the Soviet Union. If it did not enter the war, would be on the path of political blackmail. Another danger lurked in the possibility of America entering the war at an early stage. It was unlikely that she would have watched calmly as England was slowly strangled. In this war of air and naval power America could have entered relatively early, but in the event of a German invasion of England, at that time she would have been too late. Still, if Germany had a truly unified military leadership, it would have been possible to venture down this path with a hope of success though given the existence of the constant threat of intervention by the Soviet Union or America, and this, of course, only if strictly limited to the goal of destroying British air power and blockading its sea communications. Any deviation toward the dubious ideas of fighting against the spirit of the enemy nation by raiding cities could only jeopardise the success of the war. A war over the Mediterranean Sea is cited as the second possible path that could be taken to defeat England. Hitler or the German military command in general was reproached for the fact that they could not break free from the shackles of continental think. They allegedly could never properly appreciate the importance of the Mediterranean as the lifeblood of the British Empire. It is possible that Hitler was thinking in continental terms. She answers. But the other question is whether the loss of the Mediterranean Sea to England would really have led to her refusal to continue the war, and what the consequences would have been for Germany of conquering the Mediterranean Sea area. Undoubtedly, the loss of position in the Mediterranean would have been a severe blow to Britain. India, the Middle East, and thus England's oil supply would have been severely affected. In addition, the final blockade of her communications in the Mediterranean would have severely undermined England's supply. But would this blow have been fatal? To this question, in my opinion, must be answered in the negative. In this case, for England would have remained open to the Far and Middle East through the Cape of Good Hope which could not be blocked. In this case, it would be necessary to create a tight ring of blockade around the British Isles with the help of submarines and aircraft, that is, to choose the first way. But this would have required the concentration of all aviation here, so that there would be nothing left for the Mediterranean Sea. No matter how painful for England the loss of Gibraltar, Malta, positions in Egypt and the Middle East, this blow would not be fatal for her. On the contrary, these losses would rather have hardened the English will to fight, it is in their character. The British nation would not have recognized these losses as fatal to itself and would have continued the struggle even more fiercely. So, it would in all probability have refuted the well-known assertion that the Mediterranean Sea was the lifeblood of the British Empire. It is also very doubtful whether the Dominions would not have followed England in continuing her struggle. The second question is what consequences the outcome of a decisive struggle for the Mediterranean would have had for Germany. The first is that Italy could have been a good base for the struggle, but that her armed forces would have made a very modest contribution to the struggle. This position did not require confirmation by events, since everything was already clear at that time. In particular, it could not be expected that the Italian fleet would be able to drive the British out of the Mediterranean. Germany, therefore, had to bear the full brunt of this struggle. 
Moreover, the matter could have been complicated by the fact that the Italian ally would have regarded the Mediterranean as its water area and would have laid claim to a dominant position there. If we wanted to deprive Great Britain of her position in the Mediterranean, hoping to give her a fatal blow, it would be necessary to take Malta and Gibraltar and expel the British from Greece and Egypt. There is no doubt that the German armed forces, if they had moved their actions to the Mediterranean, in military terms would have solved this problem. However, this path would inevitably lead further. The seizure of Gibraltar required either the consent of Spain, which in fact could not be obtained, or it was necessary to put pressure on Spain. In both cases, this would have led to the end of Spain's neutrality. Germany would have had no choice but to organize the protection of the coast of the Iberian Peninsula with the consent or against the will of the Spanish and Portuguese governments, and at the same time to take over the supply of the area. Resistance would have to be reckoned with both in Spain and, above all, in Portugal, which believed that its colonies would in this case soon be occupied by the English. At any rate, the Iberian Peninsula would absorb a large part of the German army for a long time. The forcible occupation of the Iberian Peninsula countries could have had a disastrous effect for us on the United States and the Latin American countries, unless a valid understanding could be reached with France, which was almost impossible in view of Italian and Spanish claims to French colonial areas. It would then become necessary to occupy French North Africa if we were determined to prevent England from ever regaining possession of the Mediterranean area. If we expelled the English from Egypt, this route and in the eastern Mediterranean Sea would then inevitably lead to the Middle East, especially in view of the fact that it would be necessary to cut off England's oil supply routes. It was believed that the establishment of a base in the Middle East would give Germany two advantages. The first was the possibility of threatening India. The second was to flank the Soviet Union, which might deter the Soviet Union from entering the war against Germany. I think this line of thinking is wrong, leaving aside the fact that it was very doubtful what effect the strengthening of the German army for a long period in the Middle Eastern countries would have on the position of those nations. Two conclusions can be drawn. Operations from the Middle East region against India or against the Soviet Union, for the mere reason of utilizing communications, could never be carried out to the extent that would guarantee actual success. The naval power of England would constantly, in this case, play a decisive role. The appearance of Germany in the Middle East would by no means deter the Soviet Union from entering the war against Germany. On the contrary, it would rather lead to it. The whole point of the question of the struggle for the Mediterranean area is, in my opinion, as follows. The loss of a position in the Mediterranean would not be a fatal blow to England. Further, a decisive struggle for the Mediterranean would tie up large German forces for a long time, which would greatly increase the temptation for the Soviet Union to go to war against Germany. This was all the more possible because the prizes it probably wanted, namely the Balkans and a dominant influence in the Middle East, could only be won in a war against Germany. The route across the Mediterranean to achieve victory over England was the detour that can be compared to that of Napoleon when he hoped to deal a fatal blow to England by going through Egypt to India. This path was to divert German forces for a long time in a direction that was by no means decisive. This position gave, on the one hand, the possibility of arming the British mainland, and on the other hand, a great chance to the Soviet Union against Germany. The route across the Mediterranean Sea was in reality an evasion of a solution not hoped to be achieved in a war against the British Isles. This led to the third route discussed in 1940, the route of invasion of the British Isles. Before turning to this question, it is necessary to note concerning the conduct of the war in the Mediterranean Sea, that in it in fact, as was then often the case in Russia, Hitler never concentrated the necessary forces in time. A cardinal mistake was the refusal to capture Malta which could well have been done in an earlier phase of the war. This refusal played a decisive role, after all, for the subsequent loss of North Africa, with all its consequences. In any case, in July 1940, Hitler drew up a plan for the invasion of the British Isles and instructed that preparations be made. The operation was to be prepared under the cipher name Sea Lion, but was to be conducted only under certain prerequisites. The form in which this operation was to be carried out the friction which had arisen in connection with the matter, above all between the OK and the chief naval staff, had already been reported by others on the opposing side. One has also written about the reasons or pretexts which, in the end, must have justified the abandonment of this undertaking.
Here I shall therefore touch upon only three important questions. Now could the invasion of England have compelled her to give up the struggle? That is, would it have brought us, if the operation had been successful, a complete victory? Could we have counted on the success of the invasion at all, and what would have been the consequences of the failure of the operation? What were the reasons that finally forced Hitler to abandon the invasion, and thus from achieving victory over England, and turn the army against the Soviet Union? On the first question it must be said that invasion would have been the quickest way to defeat England. Both of the other ways we have discussed above could not lead to a quick victory, but would that victory have been final? It is possible and very likely that Churchill's government, even after the conquest of the British Isles, would have tried to continue the war from Canada. Whether all the dominions would therefore have followed him on his way is a question we shall not discuss. At any rate, the conquest of the British Isles would not have meant the final defeat of the British Empire. The most important thing, apparently, was the following. After the conquest of the British Isles by the Germans, the enemy would have lost the base, which, at least then, was necessary for the offensive from the sea to the European continent. To carry out an invasion across the Atlantic without using the British Isles as a springboard was absolutely impossible at that time, even in the event of America's entry into the war. Nor could it be doubted that, after defeating England and disabling the British Air Force, driving the British fleet across the Atlantic, and destroying the military potential of the British Isles, Germany would have been in a position to rapidly improve the situation in the Mediterranean. It could be said, therefore, that even if the British government, after the loss of the British Isles, had tried to continue the war, it had hardly any chance of winning it. Would England in that case have been followed by the Dominions? Would the latent threat that the Soviet Union posed to Germany have ceased to exist? If the Soviets did not expect to open a second front in Europe in the near future, would not Stalin then have turned to Asia with Hitler's consent? Would America have undertaken her crusade against Germany if she alone had to essentially bear the brunt of the war? No one can now, or could then give a decisive answer to this. Certainly Germany also had no possibility then of achieving peace on the other side of the seas. One thing is certain. Her position after a successful invasion of the British Isles would have been incomparably more favourable than ever as a result of the path on which Hitler had embarked. From the military point of view, therefore, the invasion of England in the summer of 1940, if there was any hope of success in this enterprise, was undoubtedly the right decision. What should have happened or could have happened in the event of German success in this operation in order to achieve a no-man's peace, which should always have been the goal of sound German policy, does not belong to the realm of military questions. It is better to return again to the military side of the matter, and hence to the crucial question, could the invasion of England in 1940 have been successful? Of course, opinions are always divided as to whether Operation Sea Lion had a chance of success or not. One thing that is clear is that the operation was extremely risky, citing the need for the enormous technical equipment that the Allies required for the invasion in 1944 is not enough to make the case that the operation was a success or not, is insufficient to conclude that the German invasion, which was then supported by essentially much more primitive means of transportation, was a failure, nor is it sufficient to point to the absolute superiority of the Allies in 1944 in the air and at sea, however important both of these factors may have been. On the other hand, if Germany in the summer of 1940 did not even approximately have so much advantage, it had one decisive advantage, namely the fact that it could not initially meet on the English coast any organised defence provided by well-armed, trained and well-managed troops. In fact, in the summer of 1940 England was almost totally defenceless on land against invasion. This defencelessness would have been almost complete had Hitler not allowed the British Expeditionary Corps to withdraw from Dunkirk. In the success of the invasion of England in the summer of 1940 depended on two factors. 1. From the earliest possible conduct of this operation in order to defeat England on land at the moment of its complete defencelessness and to take advantage of the favourable meteorological conditions of summer at the same time. 2. From the possibility of sufficiently paralysing the actions of the British Air Force and Navy for the period of forcing and seizure of bridgeheads. It is also obvious that due to the variability of the weather, as well as the uncertainty of whether the German aviation will be able to ensure air superiority over the English Channel, at least for this period, the Operation Sea Lion was always associated with a very high risk. Given this risk, 
the responsible higher authorities were slow and considered the operation with many reservations. Even then, it was clear that Hitler did not have a heart for this operation. In the executive, one could notice the lack of persistence and energy on the part of the higher authorities in these preparations. General Joe Dell, chief of staff of the operational leadership of the armed forces, even saw in this attempted invasion a kind of desperate step, which was not forced by the overall situation. Air Force Commander Goering, whom the armed forces leadership, as always insufficiently strictly controlled, did not consider the air war against England, which he directed, as part, albeit the most essential, of the invasion operation of the entire the methods of using the air force, which in the end severely crippled its material and personnel, show rather that he regarded the air war against the British Isles as an independent operational act and directed it in accordance with these attitudes. The naval general staff, which had first raised the question of an invasion of England, in examining the practicalities of the operation, had concluded that the operation could be carried out under certain prerequisites. Even so, he was best aware of the weakness of his means. The most positive position was perhaps the OK, although it did not at first consider the possibility of invading the British Isles at all. It is quite clear, however, that those who primarily risked themselves in Operation Sea Lion, the land army units intended for the invasion, were precisely the most intensively preparing for it and approached the endeavour with faith in success. I think I have a right to assert this, as the 38A subordinate to me was to operate in the first echelon of the invasion army, from Boloon to Bexhill Beachy Head. We were convinced of the possibility of success, but we did not underestimate the danger. Probably, however, we did not know enough of what alarmed the other two branches of the armed forces, especially the Navy. It is known that basically two reasons, or two pretexts, caused Hitler to abandon. In the end, the plan for Operation Sea Lion. The first was the fact that the preparation of this operation would take a long time, with the result that the first echelon of the invasion could begin forcing at the earliest on September 24, that is, at a time when, even in the case of a successful operation of the first echelon, there would be no guarantee that in the strait can be expected meteorological conditions conducive to further operations. Second and decisive circumstance was that our aviation in this period failed to achieve the necessary air superiority over England. If even we accept that in September 1940, these factors may have seemed decisive for the refusal to invade England, then by doing so we will not yet answer the question of whether the invasion was possible under a different leadership in Germany. Yes, it is these factors that are ultimately at issue when we evaluate Hitler's decision to avoid a decisive battle with England and attack the Soviet Union. At issue, therefore, is the question of whether both of the factors named the delay of Operation Sea Lion and the inadequate results of the air battle for England were inevitable. As to the first of these factors, the postponement of the landing until the last decade of September, it is clear that it could have been avoided. If there had been any war plan, which also provided in advance for the defeat of England, much of the technical preparations for the invasion could have been made before the end of the campaign in the West. If such a plan existed, it would have been unthinkable that Hitler would have allowed the British Expeditionary Corps to withdraw from Dunkirk for any reason. At least, delaying the timing of the landing until the fall would not have happened if the German leadership timed the invasion at the time of the defeat of France, that is, in mid-June, rather than in mid-July. Preparations for the invasion on the basis of the order received in July, with the full use of all possibilities, could be generally completed by mid-September. Had the decision been taken four weeks earlier, it would have made it possible to begin forcing the strait as early as mid-August. As for the second factor that caused the abandonment of Operation Sea Lion, the insufficient results of the air battle for England, it is the reeking dard, we must say the following. It must be considered a mistake of the military leadership intention to achieve air superiority over England through an isolated air war launched many weeks before the earliest possible date of invasion. The leadership wanted to achieve a guarantee of the success of the invasion by mastering the airspace over England even before the invasion. In so doing, only wasted the strength of the German air force in premature battles fought under unfavourable conditions. With a sound assessment of their own and the enemy's forces and capabilities, the Air Force Command should at least have had doubts as to whether their forces were sufficient and capable of achieving decisive success against the British aircraft and aircraft factories by fighting over England. 
At first, the German Air Force Command underestimated the English fighter aircraft, overestimated the performance of its bomber aircraft, and was taken by surprise by the presence of the enemy's effective radar system. In addition, it was known that our bombers and, above all, fighters had insufficient range and thus insufficient depth of invasion. Enemy aviation was able to evade our strikes aimed at destroying it. We do not mention the fact that the German fighters had to fight over England under more unfavorable conditions than the enemy. Bombers could not receive sufficient cover by fighters if they made flights that exceeded the range of the fighters. This consideration alone should have induced the Air Force Command to launch decisive battles against the British Air Force only at a time when it would have to take the fight on equal terms, that is, over the straits or over the coast, in direct operational connection with the infantry. The German command finally made another mistake by changing the operational objective of the air raids. Despite the previously mentioned, partly foreseen, partly unexpected unfavorable fighting conditions, just at the moment when the success of the operation hung in the balance. On September 7, the main thrust of the attacks was shifted to London, a target not in any operational connection with the preparations for the invasion. However desirable it might have been to achieve air superiority before the invasion began, Still, a common-sense consideration of all factors should have compelled the German high command to use air power for the decisive blow only in direct connection with the invasion. Of course, it may be objected that in this way of utilizing the German air force, it would have had too many tasks. V. Raids on British air bases in southern England. Of their cover for the landing of landing craft in French ports. Most detecting transports crossing the straits support of the first echelon of invasion troops during their landing, serpenting the actions of the British fleet in cooperation with the navy and coastal artillery. But these tasks did not have to be accomplished all at once, although in time they had to be solved quickly one after the other. So, for example, the English fleet, with the exception of lightships based on the ports of southern England, could apparently enter the battle only when the first echelon of invasion troops would have already landed. The fate of the battle would have depended on the outcome of the great air battle, which would have played out over the Straits or over southern England from the moment the army and navy would have begun operations. In this battle the conditions for German air power would have been much more favourable than in its raids on the British mainland. This mode of warfare would naturally have meant that everything would have been at stake, but that was the price to be paid in those circumstances if an invasion was to be undertaken at all. If Hitler postponed the plan to invade England in September 1940 for the reasons mentioned above, then these reasons may indeed have been valid. That these reasons came to light at all then depended on the fact that within the German high command there was no one other than the political figure Hitler who was responsible for the overall direction of the war effort. There was no authority who would have prepared a timely plan of war against England and who would have been able to direct the invasion as a single operation of all three branches of the armed forces. If the German command in the summer of 1940, as a result of the reasons I have described, missed the chance to successfully end the war with England, the reasons lie, at any rate, not only in the shortcomings of the organization of the high command, but to a large extent in the political doctrine of Hitler. There is obviously no question that Hitler had a desire to avoid war with England and with the British Empire. He often said that it was not in Germany's interest to destroy the British Empire. He believed that it represented a major political achievement. Even if one does not fully trust these statements by Hitler, one thing is still clear. Hitler knew that if the British Empire were destroyed, the air would not be him or Germany, but America, Japan, or the Soviet Union. Based on these considerations, his position towards England will always be clear. He did not want war with England, nor did he expect it. He wanted, if possible, to avoid a decisive battle with that power. This position of his and the fact that he did not expect such a complete victory over France explains to us also why Hitler did not have a war plan that provided for a victory over England after the victory over France. After all, he did not want to land in England. His political concept was at odds with the strategic requirements revealed after the victory over France. Fatal was the fact that his political concept did not find sympathy from the British. In contrast, Hitler had always been opposed to the Soviet Union. Even though he had made a pact with Stalin in 1939, he distrusted this country and underestimated it at the same time. He feared the traditional expansionist aspirations of the Russian state, to which, however, he himself opened the gates to the West again with the Moscow Pact. 
one can assume that Hitler was aware that one day both of these regimes, which had become immediate neighbours, would collide. Further, as a politician, Hitler was obsessed with the idea of living space which he felt obliged to provide for the German people, this living space he could only seek in the East. If both of the thoughts I have cited allowed for the postponement of a clash with the Soviet Union until a later time, they must have taken hold of the mind of a man like Hitler with renewed vigour after he had practically become master of the continent by defeating France, since the threatening accumulations of Soviet troops on Germany's eastern frontier were raising doubts about the future position of the Kremlin. Hitler was now confronted with the question of invading England. He no doubt realised the great risk then involved in such an enterprise. If the invasion failed, the German army and navy forces operating there would be lost. German aviation would also have been greatly weakened in this unsuccessful battle. From a purely military point of view, however, even the failure of the invasion of England did not yet mean such a weakening of German military power that it could not be restored. More serious would be the political consequences. Take, for example, the fact that the failure of the invasion would have strengthened the desire of the British to continue the war. One may point, further, to the position America and the Soviet Union would have taken in this case. But above all such a clear military defeat, as the failure of the invasion of England would have been, would have seriously undermined the dictator's prestige in Germany and throughout the world. But such a danger the dictator could not expose himself to. He had always shied away from the idea of a decisive battle with England, so he was afraid of the risk this time. He wanted to avoid the risk of a decisive battle with Britain. Instead of defeating that country, he hoped to convince it of the necessity of an agreement, trying to knock out of its hands the last continental sword on which England must have pinned her hopes. Stidis evasion of what was undoubtedly a great military and political risk, Hitler made a great mistake. For one thing was clear, was afraid to start a battle against England at a favourable moment, Germany sooner or later had to find herself in a critical situation. The longer the war with England dragged on, the greater became the danger threatening Germany from the east. After Hitler had abandoned the decisive battle with England in the summer of 1940 and missed his only chance, he could no longer play the waiting game. Under the pressure of necessity, he now decided to try to eliminate an enemy such as the Soviet Union by means of preventive war, since there was no longer any enemy in the West that would be dangerous to him on the continent. In reality, Hitler, out of fear of the risk of invading England, took the even greater risk of a war on two fronts. However, as a consequence of belatedly planning the invasion and ultimately abandoning it, he lost an entire year, the year that could have decided the outcome of the war, a loss of time that Germany could no longer recoup. With the cancellation of Operation Sea Lion, 38 corps returned to normal combat life in late September. Our means of transportation were withdrawn from the ports subjected to British air raids, but nothing was yet known about Hitler's intentions regarding the Soviet Union as the final decision to attack the Soviet Union was made much later. I received the first hint of impending events only when I was summoned in the spring of 1941 for a new task. 